Maria, <laughs> welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. Thank you very much. It's great to have you here. Um, when people ask you, what do you do if they don't know? What do you tell them? I say that I'm a singer who does a bit of acting sometimes. But, but mostly I'm a mother, I think. But you're, you know, when I look at what you're doing this year, that doesn't even begin to describe what you're doing. We're busy, yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I have a desire to tell stories and songwriting or singing was the first way to do that, obviously. And then I sort of fell into acting and that became another way to do that. And then in the last while, we've just started to figure out some other ways of doing it. And I, I, I find they all kind of help each other out. Mm. I think singing or the gigs anyway, I think, have probably become more theatrical because of the influence of character acting. And I think becoming a person in a in a drama has become deeper because of the songwriting of going into another kind of point of view mm. and now making films I think seems to be a kind of natural progression it's obviously a desire to tell stories that you have can control the whole sort of thing from start to finish and also you know combined with the a desire to stop watching myself age on a <laughs> right. 50 foot screen I was like hmm <laughs> I should jump sides now if I can um but it's been really joyful process to discover that. And then we're we're going to do some other things as well. We're going to hopefully go to Tallinn and make a radio documentary. But we did do one of those before. I just I think the people I've most been inspired by the artists mm. are um, Patrick Scott and Paddy Smith. Mm. And oh, they're both their initials are P.S. I never actually thought about that before, but they did loads of things yeah. and never thought that was unusual or were in any way conflicted about it. So I suppose I have never been either. It's all it's all coming from the same place. Like yeah. it's all coming from me. So I don't find it um, confusing or, or distract as long as I concentrate properly on the one I'm doing mm. at the time. I think it becomes if you try and do things at the same time, you do nothing well. But if you properly commit to what you're doing then then it's okay and what is the documentary in Tallinn well gosh I hope we get to do it I think we will um it, there's a song festival there mm. and it only happens once every five years and a friend of ours in Canada who's originally from Estonia he told us about it and um it's called actually I think it's just called the song festival of Estonia now, but in 1988, um, something happened around the festival that was called the Singing Revolution. The festival's been in existence since the 1800s, but then during um, when Estonia was part of the USSR, it became a sort of a bigger, more symbolic thing where people used it to um, hold on to their cultural identity in the way that in Ireland we would have had hedge schools and things mm. to pass on Irish language and songs when it was banned they would have the same thing. They would have practiced the Russian songs, but they also would have snuck in and maintained some um, more Estonian national songs. Mm -hmm. And in 1988, there's 30,000 people. Did I say that? There's 30,000 oh. people singing in harmony, in choirs together. Right, OK. To the audience. That was uh, the first thing that I heard. Yeah, and yeah. then I was just like, I have to go and see that. Yeah. I, ha I just, I, I'm so moved by the sound of live mm. singing anyway I just can't imagine what that would be like and and that and I won't be responding because I don't speak Estonian I don't understand it I won't be responding to the words mm. I will only be responding to the music to the voices so I mean, probably what will happen is we'll go and make a documentary and it will just be me weeping <laughs> for two days <laughs> listening to this beautiful music. But in 1988, when I started to research it as well, this thing, there was another festival on in the town and afterwards, then they were getting close to independence mm. then or closer. And um, there was an, uh, like the Old Town Festival, I think, the Altstadt Fest or something. 
And afterwards, people just kind of spontaneously went to the singing fields, the big um, sort of stadium space where it's on, just spontaneously and sat there and began to sing. And I, 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 there, there was, I don't know, 300,000 people there or something at, at, at one stage over two days it happened. And they just sang the seven national songs in a kind of cycle over and over again. And I I was so moved mm-hmm. by the idea of that. And then also I discovered that um, that happened on my wedding anniversary as well. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it all just seemed synchronicity. So I yeah, we're planning to do that. It's on in July this year. And is music still the thing that can kind of transport you to somewhere else that no other kind of medium can? Yeah, I think so. Mm. I, I, it's kind of undeniable mm. thing for me, really, and um, d- deeply moving and or just, you know, affecting or an invitation to dance or yeah. or to think or a provocation. But I, yeah, I, I can't imagine a world without music. I can imagine a world without lots of things, but I just can't imagine a world without music. Was that always there? Can you like, was that always part of your life? I think so. I used to get into trouble a lot when I was small for singing because Mm. I would get an earworm in my head, like something that I'd heard on the radio and I just would sing it again and again and I wouldn't be able to stop and I would drive people mad. So, yeah, I remember. And I also remember, oh, my God, I was really young. I was about six or seven, six. And I was going to a fesh kjole in Wexford mm. from Enniscorthy, where we lived at the time. And my uncle was bringing me and two of my cousins. Mm. I think I was in the Irish dancing or something like that. And on the way back, we stopped at a pub. Sure. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> and Good old uh, kids. <laughs> yeah. And uh there was a little stage in the corner and I just was so high after the whole notion of the fesh mm. and the dancing and the people and everything. I walked over to the stage like completely uninvited <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> unannounced. Nobody wanted this to happen, especially not my uncle and just started singing. I mean, right. I that was the only time I ever did anything like that. But I obviously was, yeah, really annoying child as the only but you, you were enjoying it. you were on the high of the of the whole I just day. was in a different place yeah. altogether obviously I've forgotten all about that actually. but did you feel that did you even does it did that become something do you think that might have lodged in your head that like this can actually take me somewhere again like you know I can transport myself I, I don't can. no I don't really think so I think that was just a little like just a little blip of a moment. Mm. It obviously was in there, but like way, way, way back because I didn't um, I didn't get into a band in yeah. school or anything. I just didn't meet anybody else who um, played instruments mm. or was forming bands or so I just never really thought that it was kind of a possibility until I went to um, college and then I yeah. met people who played music and got together and I was like, well, of course, this is what mm. you do. But it took me until then to kind of think about it, which is unusual, I think. And you had moved to Wexford when you were four. Yeah. Uh, My dad was dad, from Enniscorthy. Right. Yeah. And why did he want to go back? He um, opened a business there. Right. He was in um, the rag trade. He mm. sold uh, men's clothes and was really really dapper man himself and he got the opportunity to open um a shop there it was okay. called the man's shop right. and uh so that's why we moved back and his you know his mum was there and and some of his um brothers and their families and it was a family vibration and she your her his mother taught you how to play poker did she baby she did okay. wow you really did your research? <laughs> Where did you find out these things? She was an incredible woman. Mm. Um, Baby Doyle uh, was her name. And she was like a magical really? granny. Yeah. yeah. She, you know, she was small and slim and had long, long white hair that she wore up in a bun. Right. And she would um, feed you full of sweets. Yeah. Like brilliant. And she would correct your grammar. Mm. My friends and I, she would say all okay. the time, things like that. And 
she taught us all how to play cards. She thought it was um, a life skill. <laughs> like That's a good obviously, it was yeah, and it was a long time before anybody thought about um, the advent of smartphones. Yeah. And she just said, you know, you might be on your own sometime, waiting for a train, or it'd be great now if you could play solitaire. That would be a mm. lovely thing to be able to do. And so yeah, we all learned how to play patience and build card houses and play poker and rummy. Yeah, she was. Oh, was she fun. kind of was a bohemian kind of lifestyle or was it? No, uh, not at all. No, she was. No, she was really um, practical and organized and, and quite devout. Right. But she just she thought cards were good and yeah. she was good at cards, I suppose. Okay. Lots of the Doyles were. They're really right. they had that kind of numbers brain and okay. they the maths sort of it just made sense to them and they liked a little bit of a gamble and Did all they, that yeah. yeah two of my uncles worked on the toes and okay had greyhounds all that kind of right. stuff yeah so that well that's a bit you know it's not that conventional like it's not maybe it's not bohemian but it's there's a bit of kind of a bit of wildness and daring there yeah i i'd say you'd be you'd be hard pushed now to find an Irish family that didn't yeah, have I some suppose. little that's, kind yeah, of that's true. yeah <coughs> You, Flutter of some kind. Yeah, although my, my grandmother was devout, but she never taught me how to play cards. You know, she wasn't, it was just devout down the line, you know. Not complaining, I'm just... Saying. No, I'm, I'm, well, I'm glad I had the, I'm glad I got the poker instructions <laughs> as well. And then you moved back to Bray. Yeah. When you were, what was it, 12? Yeah. And what was, what happened, was it, was the business... What was happening to the shop? That, that just didn't really work okay. out. My dad was much better at um, uh, choosing and selling clothes than mm. the kind of bigger picture of running that. And yeah. He really found he didn't really like that. And it wasn't what he liked to do. We moved a few times. We moved in between um, okay. Enniscorthy and Bray and we'd lived somewhere else before. We moved a lot uh, when I was small until we got to Bray. But it was always in search of um, something better. Mm -hmm. My parents were looking for some slight, yeah, a better employment or something like mm -hmm. that, better prospects for us, for their family. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so we, we just learned to do that. And did but then we stayed in Bray. And was do you look back on it as happy times? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess it suits some people better than others. I think it certainly made me a kind of um, more flexible person. Mm. And I went to a few different schools yeah. and I had to kind of figure that out a little bit. Um, I, but I think you get if, you know, if we were moving as a family, it yeah, wasn't yeah. like I was kind of off thrown from one place to mm. the other on my own. So there was some stability within the moving. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think I learned some things from it. I learned to think about people and the way they interact um, probably more quickly than mm. than I would have done otherwise. Because you're having to make friends wherever yeah. you go. Yeah, and figure out what was happening yeah. when you go into a space yeah. with people. What is the dynamic? And usually you can see pretty clearly there are people who are leaders or mm. manipulators or you might spot a bully fairly. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. there's there's stuff to look out for and you get um become aware of it and you've been aware of patterns probably more than you would if you were just going in one school all your life you're going to different yeah. schools and but seeing the same types of or just people. you certainly I don't know if I would have been as conscious enough to to recognize that or call mm. it pattern but I I definitely got to see kind of the the way people interact right. I got to understand a good bit about that or mm. I'd see something coming and go oh, I know that that's that's not going to go well I yeah, won't go yeah. near that yeah. or something um, and then when you went you said when you went to college when you went to Trinity music was the thing then that you suddenly encountered people making music yeah. like how quickly did that aspect of your life open up when you went to Trinity pretty quickly I think I guess I can't I can't remember exactly, but pretty quickly. I mean, I was the only person uh, from my school who I was the only person that I knew in college. Right. I knew one other person who was a couple of years ahead of me. Um, 
but I didn't know anybody else like at all in my year mm. or in my, you know, in my in the bigger group of what I was doing or in first year in college. Right. So I had to, in, again, form entirely new uh, relationships and, mm. and yeah, make friends. And it, it's a very interesting time, I think, of your life because you're that kind of period between 18 and 22, which is mostly the time people go to college or mm. it's really hugely formative. I think you sort of know a little bit about yourself and what you like and the kinds of people you might yeah. be drawn to, but you're still not tied into huge um, commitments, probably, probably for most people mm. of, you know, providing for other people or whatever. So you have this kind of time to figure. I think that's what college is mostly about really figuring out a bit more about yourself and other people than actually the subjects you're learning. And did you find it daunting or was it just, you know, something you took to? I was absolutely transfixed by the grounds mm -hmm. of Trinity. The minute I walked in, um, I just, it was so beautiful. Yeah. I still think it's so beautiful, but I, I didn't really come from that. Mm. And so I just I felt as if I was in a film. Right. I, I really. And then, you know, I carried on with the sort of pretentiousness of that feeling for a while when I was literally like, you know, talking to people about Plato or something right. as if you're the first person that's ever, <laughs> you know, done yeah, that yeah, or yeah. read him or talked about it. It was. <coughs> It was it was a little daunting. Certainly, mm. I I was, um, I certainly was fearful at the beginning and felt alone or felt that I would be found out. Mm. Certainly, people a lot of most people seemed much more confident and and to have people they knew and bonds and stuff like that. But of course, years later, you realize that no, everybody yeah. was afraid and just some people are better at hiding it than others. And you weren't good at hiding it. You I was great at were hiding you? it. Yeah, yeah okay. I was brilliant. Right. Yeah, nobody knew. People were actually really terrified of me. They told oh, really? me afterwards, yeah, because I walked around in some big, you know, in a huge kind of a bronze um, raincoat and yeah. with a huge belt that I'd gotten a second hand shop and a huge belt and a kind of permanent sort of don't talk to me oh, scowl really? on. Okay. Yeah, right. but it was it was total. Um, Fear, yeah, yeah, or you know, but I, I but anyway, oh, I did, they did, talk I did what, make friends. They did talk to you. What would happen? Like you just start talking. I'd have later. been delighted, of course, <laughs> but if they talked to me. But um, I did make friends eventually. Yeah, yeah you obviously just start. You find your place in a lecture, don't you? You're either mm. a, up the front or or a down the backer, and you start to find your crew, and then yeah, just discover music and hanging out, and it was brilliant. And did, time. did music become because I know you said like you got your dad brought you back like a Billy Holiday record I think it was from That's right. from London was it on, yeah. a, on a trip and that was what kind of opened up a, a por portal for you in some ways but when when you went to college then like were people introducing you to music you hadn't yeah. heard and yeah constantly and also were as excited about it mm. or as moved about it as I was and um, everybody was talking about just stuff I'd never I remember. Betty Everett, somebody got me this this album, this incredible singer, Betty Everett, never heard of her. Loads of people were into Ian Jury, mm -hmm. J just yeah, loads of Echo and the Bunnymen, all kinds of all kinds of stuff was happening and people were were turning each other on to it. And yeah. of course, it was still the um, age of the mixtape, mm -hmm. you know, that people would take the time and yeah. put that stuff together and give it to you and really try and find obscure things as well, of course, to, uh, you know, one up the other mixtape mm. or whatever. It was great. But then singing became like, how did like that's music, but how does it how did you go into like becoming a singer then out of that? Well, happen? I met some people who were um, again, it kind of happened by accident. They were entering a sloga competition. Mm. So it was Osgoelga. And the main singer really wanted to not sing all the time and wanted to play piano. And so they um, I knew their the brother of one of them mm. and they said, oh, Maria can sing and she speaks Irish. So why don't, why don't you do it? 
So I did do that and it was really good fun. And mm-hmm. then we went on and started singing in a band. And then I started to meet other people in mm-hmm. other bands. And then you're just suddenly you're if you like it, you know, yeah. then you're in that world and you're never going to leave. Probably. That was Hot House Flowers. Yeah. yeah. So that was kind of that was you were in a they were they were doing well. That was a successful band in Dublin. Well, we started yeah. off, yeah, playing yeah. in a little room in the magic carpet. And uh, then, yeah, just it was went on. It was really fun. And then I uh, after that, I joined the Black Velvet Band mm-hmm. with Kieran, um, which didn't actually exist when we met, yeah. although he told me it was. <laughs> what was um, that about happened there? I met him after a gig and and he I had left Hot Eyes Flowers and um, he said, oh, I, I, I know you're you're not in that band and um, I've got a band and we're making a demo and would you um would you come and sing on it right. and so i said well maybe you could um send me a tape or something just so i could listen to it and see if i you know if i thought there was anything i could add to it or you know um and he said okay so he sent me this tape and i got it and then i rang him and said yeah that like, let's but what i didn't know was that he didn't there wasn't a band and there wasn't a demo. And when I said that, then he scrambled to um, put something together. And then when I was coming in, he got somebody to give them some money to make a demo and put it all together. And that's how the Black Velvet Band came back. Right. Yeah, it's a good. And that was, but, so but it worked. Yeah. And it was. Uh, and I, but I didn't actually find that out until like about 10 years later. No way. Yeah. We were married and everything years. then. Yeah, that was going, a long, you know that didn't yeah. actually. That was just. A, he, it, I was pretty impressed. Yeah, I was like, yeah. that was a, it. Was a good way to um, ask for a date. But it was, took a long time for him to to own up to that at the same time. Yeah, I guess actually that band kind of took off, and we were probably yeah. just too busy to ever even right. think about that or question it or something. Um, and when it did take off, like there was a lot of you know music like in Dublin at that time. There was an awful yeah. lot of bands. There was an awful lot happening, like. What what would you have described like your ambitions at that time? Well, um, I guess everything seemed possible. Mm. There were there were a lot of bands. There were a lot of gigs. Yeah. People were constantly touring Ireland. Never mind um, Britain or further afield. Mm. There were just really big gigs all the time and a lot of people playing and you'd meet everyone at festivals all the time or, you know, you'd be coming to a venue and the poster of, you know, something happens would have been up from the night before or the stunning would be coming the night after mm. or an emotional fish or what, you know, it was just, it was really, um, it was really busy and active. I don't know if I really thought very long term right. about anything really. I just yeah. was kind of enjoying playing music and traveling around. And, and it wasn't, you didn't have a kind of, uh, like career plan or any ideas like this is what I want us to achieve or I want to achieve. Or Kieran did. Yeah, right. And the Black Velvet Band really was his, um, you know, it came from a huge well of songs mm. that he that he had. And um, oh, I think he, yeah, I think he, he wanted to just keep going forever yeah. and rule the world. Right. Yeah. And was the music for you the thing that kind of like that was the most important thing like as you said you know you said you you write songs to uh, make sense of the world for yourself like I was wondering if yeah. music always was was that thing it kind of kind of sort of grounded you and maybe gave you a sense of where you were in the world well I think that it just um, explains things a bit better to me mm-hmm. sometimes I don't, uh, I sometimes don't really understand how to, it's like, it's like as if um, I, I, I slip a little, like a little wee, like if, if you think of your, the way that you act or, or the way that you exist as a sort of a, like a wheel with little teeth in it, you know, like a cog mm. thing. Sometimes I like I slip one or something and I and I find that um, I, I find it difficult to express myself properly and I will like completely overshare with somebody I've just met, <laughs> you know, by by accidentally, like I just the, the thing is wrong somehow and not speak at all to somebody who 
I'm close to who I need mm. to speak to. Uh, but um, music then is just a better way of expression for me. I don't really think then. Right. I just am able to sing or find melody mm. or some words that are not so. It's. Oh, it's more like the the words can express something bigger than just words can. So I'm mm. even finding it difficult mm. now to yeah, yeah. explain what I mean. But it was but instinctive. It's, it's instinctive. Yeah. For you. And it's a kind of a a safe place yeah. somehow. I don't worry. I, do, I, do, I just don't. I don't worry. I don't think. And was that the same of acting or was that something that you found that you had to kind of think about more or didn't come as naturally? It was just completely accidental. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I got my first job because I was a singer and they were looking yeah. for singers and they hadn't found it in their acting fraternity and they just did an open audition. And then I went back to um, singing and didn't think about it again mm-hmm. at all. And then um, Jim Sheridan was making. Uh, was it in the name of the father? Mm-hmm. And a lot of the same crew were the crew that I had worked with before were on that film. It was about a year later or maybe mm. a little more. And I went up to the set to say hello to them because there had been some really lovely people that spent a good bit of time with and I, yeah. I you know, wanted to see them again. And um, I realised when I was there, I thought that I would go up maybe for half an hour, have lunch, say hello to people and, and leave again. Mm-hmm. And I realised when I was there that I really hadn't liked it. The mm. feeling of um, being part of this huge team of people there's a good hundred people often yeah. on a film and it's a uh, it's a lot of kinetic energy mm. it's kind of a nice it's a kind of a strong feeling to be part of one bit of this much mm. bigger thing and uh, I just liked it and and I, and that's what I wanted to go back to I think just the kind of human connection of that and a different way to tell stories it's sort of well, it takes the pressure off you in a way because mm-hmm. they're not your it's not your story. And also you didn't write it. They're not your words. Um, so it was d- kind of a lighter thing to do somehow. But that film, did it help that that film that you had done was the commitments and it was a kind of a special set to be on? Because, you know, I think you, you people made friendships there that kind of endured that you were all like. And I remember that, like the, the sense of sort of anticipation and excitement around the commitments and the people who had been cast in it in Dublin at the time was a huge thing. Really? Like, yeah, I remember, like, I, I I knew a couple of people, like, I knew Glenn Hansard a bit, and, you know, I remember this happening and everyone going, this is a great thing that's kind of happening, and then the film came out and it was such a, you know, there was such a level. I think for Dublin at that time, it can't really be overstated how big the commitments was, because it, a, you know, a director had come in and done this film that showed a real Dublin and uh, like so there must have been an excitement level and, a, and an adrenaline level a level to be attached to that I don't really I don't remember that do you not no I came in very late to the um, casting process mm. so I hadn't been kind of following it down for months and months and um, it kind of happened quite quickly for me at the end and then making it I suppose I had nothing else to compare it to. Right. So yeah, it's my yeah. only experience of that. And then once it was done, I was done That's, with yeah. it as well. So I was just like, yeah, OK, so uh, none of that really. Did not, you didn't link like was there not temptation to kind of go off and kind of become an actress or do anything like that on the back of it? Because it was such a success. No, no, uh, no. I was, had really great experience, yeah. really good time. And then mm. I wanted to I had an album to be yeah. doing. And so I wanted to do that. And. But other people, yeah, I find that interesting because, you know, it was other people might have been drawn to that the glamour of it or that sense that this is where there's a lot of there's a lot of it, you know, excitement around this. Maybe I can just immediately do this again or a version of it. But you were kind of, no, I've done that back to music. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I don't I, I don't find that confusing. No, no, I don't say it's or confusing. Strange. No, I don't think it's strange at all. I just, I'm just interested that that was you were kind of clear in what you wanted to do always. Yeah. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I think I usually. I'm not really attracted to ephemeral notions. Really, mm. I'm attracted to 
bits, actual bits of work. Yeah. Usually. Yeah. And the idea of uh, fame itself, mm. I think that's what you're, is that what you're asking me about? Well, kind of the so. idea yeah, of, yeah. of looking. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that actually would be a kind of a, if I if I felt that something was particularly going to bring that towards me, mm. I would have to go away from right. that. I would yeah, find yeah. that as as a notion really um, uh, not a not in any way attractive mm. or or beneficial. Mm. I think it would be again. I really like. I really like people. Mm. I really like observing people. I really like the way people interact and just are at mm. bus stops and in shops and it would be a huge loss to me not to be able to go to a shop with my children or that that would be that that would be um, disturbed or made yeah. unreal somehow yeah. for them or that I couldn't get a bus or that that you know that would be a, yeah a huge loss to me and I guess I've always known that so. But were there times when you felt that you had to, to step back from it or to go make sure it didn't happen? Because like... Not really. You know, no. You know, because Liam Cunningham we had on a couple of weeks ago and he was saying there were two, like, we were talking about fame and again, he'd come from a similar place to you where he'd be often, you know, he'd rejected lots of things and never interested in that famous side, although he did say that they delivered a purple Lamborghini to his house out in... in <laughs> In, uh, in Kulak and that was or in Colester so that was a kind of bonus all right but uh jeez yeah if only he only got it for a week <laughs> but uh but he said he found that's out not that, much of a present no, then but he said you find out who you know how you're how you're viewed by the people of Dublin when you drive around in a, in a Lam- purple Lamborghini god I'd say so yeah <laughs> but um but it was it was the story it was it was the stuff that that was the stuff you wanted to preserve and your and your family life and those things because I saw a line you said where you said that uh, people suspend their lives for a while, like in the pursuit of their careers or in pursuit of fame. Yes. And then you wonder, like, was it worth it? Yeah. Like, Again, that would um, I think that uh, I mean my 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 mother worked, um, mm. you know, or not and not everybody of my age had had. You know, both both parents would have worked. Yeah. So my mom always worked. So I always thought that that was certainly, you know, I never thought that it was something that I wouldn't always be doing. Mm. And then Patrick Scott, who I spoke about earlier, he was the greatest um, just teacher and kind of mentor in making your art and having a life mm-hmm. and it was all part of the one thing for him you yeah. know your life is your art and of course it is and all of the experiences that you will have when you you know share your dinner with people mm-hmm. when you have you know when you ha- when you commune with people in whatever way he was really big into eating with people breaking bread having people around mm-hmm. meeting new people and gathering together and 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 sharing experience and that enriched everything he made and i think that that's that's the way for mm-hmm. sure i don't understand that they would be that you'd compartmentalize your yeah the bits of your life that's it's, it's all the same but people do yeah i I wouldn't know how to. Yeah. I mean, maybe people do successfully. I I wouldn't know how to. So when you say at the beginning of this interview that you're, you know, you tell people you're a musician who acts and but who and who is a mother, like they all kind of come together. Like there's nothing you can't divide them into separate camps. They all inform each other. Yeah. Now I probably don't say to people now I'm a mother, but I guess I think that yeah. that's probably my yeah, most yeah. important yeah, job. Yeah. But <clears throat> yeah, they're all. I mean. Yeah, it's all just well, it's all because it's all me, yeah, right? It's yeah. all just the one person mm. and and you just you are just yourself. Mm. So I don't really I mean that there are annoying bits about that in that sometimes I am that really annoying mother who sings everything. Do you know them? <laughs> like my friend's mother was like that as well. And she just be, and sometimes I know I'm like that. I'm just like. Did you brush your teeth? And they're <laughs> my like, mother oh, was like that. Ma. But um, <laughs> you're bringing up so, flashbacks. Back. Yeah, that's that's a small <laughs> bit of an annoying bleed of one thing into the other there. But I don't. Yeah, I don't really. You just are your yeah. the person, right? So. Yeah. And how would you say you've changed as a as a 
parent over the years? Um, there's a gap between this. There's a gap between all of them. Yeah, yeah I kind of started early and I finished late. Yeah, yeah. Um, it worked really well for us as a family to do that. Having one small person at mm. a time, um, we were sort of able to cope with the organization of that and still work and still do gigs and things. Mm-hmm. Having two or more, I would have found it more difficult to move. So having a gap all the time worked. And they all sort of got a good chance at being a baby yeah, as yeah. well before someone else came along. I think it was good. But they're extraordinarily bonded as a as a team of um, a team of brothers. Um, how I got better, I think I got I. I, I probably had more energy when I was younger, mm. but I certainly had more patience as I was older. And I think actually that's a better parenting quality. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think time and listening attention is the most important thing really you can give your children. I, I probably I got a little bit. I find I find routine sometimes quite difficult. Mm-hmm. And I mean, my eldest son will definitely say that, like, he just had the worst deal in terms of school lunches that right. any okay. child yeah. ever had. Because I somehow would just every day would just go, oh, God, the lunch. I mean, you know, how many years was he going to school that I would suddenly <laughs> occur to me that I needed to have things in the fridge for school lunches? Yeah. Uh, you know, that I got better at that. I don't I don't run out of tea bags as much mm, as I used right, to yeah, in yeah. general I think that's just yeah yeah experience has, has brought that to the fore but does all that like you've talked about this in, in the past that you know in the music industry or whatever there seems to be an idea you need to kind of make a big impact straight away whereas you feel that experience and, and life has, has improved you as a musician and as a songwriter yeah for like, sure yeah which would seem like it's you know that's a kind of what you would ex- like that's a natural thing to happen yeah. and like but does all does you know being a parent inform all that and does it give a richness and a depth to the work you do sure yeah, yeah. and and life I mean I think once you become well for me anyway once I became a parent I it definitely just I suddenly was thinking in a different way because mm. I was thinking for two rather mm. than just thinking for myself. Yeah. So that it kind of changed everything. Mm. And there's good and bad bits about it as well, though. In some ways, you become a very fearful yeah. um, because you're nervous for your children and mm. how they will, you know, and how you will launch them mm. uh, sort of into the world safely. Um, but of course, there's things you, uh, you learn f- from your experience of raising them, but also f- now, like some of ours are, are, you know, they're I learn so much from them now. They Aye. they turn they're I think it is my job it, it to leave behind me more highly evolved people. Mm. So that's what that's what we're aiming for. <laughs> and they're they're just brilliant. Like they're they're really smart. They're really aware they're just really mm. think about I don't know they're much they're much they're way ahead of where I was when I was them and mm. it's so exciting to see that I think they will yeah and they're feminists you know they're right. young feminist men which is really exciting uh, to me as well but the idea that you're talking about about um in music I think like in other forms of art, like in in writing hmm. or in painting, yeah. you are expected to get better as you yeah. get older and as you practice your technique or mm. your craft or you have more experience of it and and more to say. But why would that not be the yeah. same in music? Yeah. Of course, it's the same. I don't worry about it all anymore. A few years ago, I was kind of worried about that or cross about it or I, I felt this huge kind of ageist uh, thing and I was like what fuck's sake it's not and then but now I just mm. don't care at all and I just went through that and kept going and 
our gigs got better. And so it's like, yeah. what am I, why am I even thinking about what other people think? Of that? And so I just, I jettisoned yeah. that and, and, I, and I, I'm great. I feel great again. Well, I think it probably is changing a bit, isn't it? Because there's so many people around who, like you look at like even like music like Leonard Cohen made in the last years of his life and people and like Johnny Cash and stuff like that. And it's like, there's such a body. I don't think they're really comparable though to what you were saying because they did make a huge impact yeah, early yeah, yeah, as okay. well. Yeah, that's true. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but, but there's not... There wasn't any sense of being over the hill. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. They're male as well, though. That's yeah, also okay, something yeah, that gender yeah. does come into it sometimes. But um, anyway, I don't care. Yeah, yeah, I just we're having the best gigs you've ever mm. had, really, and just got better at it and writing really good songs. And I don't know. Yeah, I'm obviously going to be um, <laughs> I'm obviously going to become an overnight sensation in my 50s. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just interested in how it, you know, it, like I think it is like I found as a, um, you know, when I became a father that it changed, like it didn't change. People say, oh, nothing else matters, you know, once you have a kid. And that's true to an extent. But I found it's like what you said, that you're kind of working for two kind of nothing else was mattered more, but everything mattered. And nothing, there was nothing more important, but everything mattered more. Yeah, I think you generally. um you become more, more, more empathetic yeah. to the world, yeah. don't you? Mm. You feel things mm. in 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 a different way, and I think that's maybe because you're sort of feeling it for them. Yeah. You're you're sort of imagining how they will feel yeah. as they encounter everything. It's, mm. Yeah. And I I thought of it when I was watching uh, the, uh, the the films you made, the color code and the. Uh, the other film you made, um, a different kind a of day. different kind of day, and I was watching a different kind of day earlier this week, and my son was a bit ill at the time, and I was kind of you know kind of vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but it's such. Did a, you cry? I did cry. <laughs> and uh, did you smile at the end? I did. Then? It's Good. lovely, but it's such a tender. You used the word tender earlier, and it's like it is such a lovely tender film without sentimentality. Yeah. And also a beautiful. Um, image of Dublin in it. Looks beautiful, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Ooh. yeah. James Mather shot that and he's an effing genius. Um, and it's all the way down through Rathmines. Mm. It's kind of an homage to yeah, Rathmines, yeah, yeah. which is we've lived kind of near there all of our um, uh, married lives. So it's kind of special hood for us and has all the things we love, our library and our mm. little bookshop and all things like that. But that was an important film for me to make a different kind of day for one of our sons has Down syndrome mm. and just often people would make huge generalizations about him and his friends and, you know, all of our children are different. And people would often say, um, oh, Daniel is Down syndrome, but mm -hmm. he has Down syndrome and it's, you know, he has an enormous personality and that is there are certain things um, due to that chromosomal difference that, that are slightly different for mm -hmm. him. But there's a whole lot of other things that he has that you uh, people just need to like for everybody. Yeah, I think you need yeah. to be careful about um, quick decisions or judgments. I mean, I understand where it comes from and why we make them. It's from an old place, isn't it? That we sort of need to um, so sad where we are, who we're dealing with and what level of safety or danger mm. is around. But um, we're too quick often to make assumptions um, without real investigation or experience. And so in the film, in a different kind of day, it's just about the experience of two young adults who have Down syndrome on a kind of pretty regular Saturday mm -hmm. afternoon and, and something kind of changes for all of them. And it doesn't it just doesn't quite go where you expect. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I love it. I'm really proud of and it. And there was a yeah, there was a personality in it. And as you say, it, it has a kind of turn that you don't anticipate. Yeah. Just to maybe say to people, just question your mm. assumptions or think, think about them. And that was your first job. It was your first directing job. Wasn't yeah. It? Yeah. We applied to the um, the film board mm. uh, to for funding for that because I mean I, I knew the story and I knew what I wanted to do but I really again because there was so little dialogue in it it was really important 
to me to for it to look really beautiful yeah. and so I wanted to get some money so we could ask you know James Mather and some other really talented people all of whom did know what they were doing mm. so I wanted to surround myself with people who really knew what they were doing as I fumbled through what I was doing but um, I, I loved it yeah and I loved the experience of it and uh, and being able to define all aspects of a story have the cast that you want have the crew mm. that you want choose the locations you want edit it yourself you know and Kieran composed the music and to collaborate on that and 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 have his me it was just it was a great experience so I did it again and I'm planning to do it again and did the come I saw Lenny Abrahamson Lenny Abrahamson said to you that your job is to make decisions that's what people are yeah. looking at you to do yeah. did that come easily to you uh, actually it was really great uh, the the best bit of advice I, I could have had I asked him to mentor me through the process because I um he's a lovely mm -hmm. uh, man and I really respect his um, his I love his films and I respect his uh, judgment and his he, he's just whenever I hear him speak I, oh, he always sounds uh, really considered and fair and and um, he was really brilliant and he spoke to him on the phone a few times and then I just before I was going to do it I had a huge panic about it and I realised that I was responsible for um, for telling the story for getting it right mm -hmm. and for you know honouring the trust that the film board and all this crew have shown in, in, in us in, mm -hmm. to make it I mean you have to fill out a lot of forms and jump through a lot of hoops to get money from an organisation yeah. like that. But when you do, you realise that they've given when they've given it to you, that means they don't have it to give to somebody else. Mm. So you really need to honour it. And I, I rang him and met him and he said, what, are you OK? And I said, no, I'm, you know, I'm fine. And I said, I, no, I have my shot list and I, mm. I think I know what I'm doing. But I said, but what about if, you know, if something goes wrong or if I have to, you know, and I, I was trying mm. to ask him yeah, with that, yeah. you know, I was just saying, like, how do I... How will I, you know, give instruction to a crew? And he just said, look, I know what you want to ask me. Your job as a director is to lead. Mm. Don't, you know, you, you don't faff around and try and, you know, spare people's feelings or, or be unable, unable to make a decision because mm. you think it might affect. You know, people want you to decide. They need somebody to lead this process so that everyone has direction. That's what it is. You're a director so that people have direction and everyone knows that this is, you know, a story that's going in the one mm. way and you're going to start here and you're going to finish here in the day. And things will happen that will mess up your time or your shot list and you make a decision to deal with that and you move on. Mm -hmm. And and it was brilliant. I felt really empowered by that. And, yeah. and, and a few things did happen that that changed things we hadn't expected. And I had to make choices and mm. I just and we had little time so just made a choice and hoped that it was the right one yeah. you know and inside were you going god I don't know if this is the right one a but couple of yeah. times <laughs> yeah yeah but but it's better than being but, indecisive uh, yeah yeah there isn't there isn't room for that mm. there just isn't room and or time yeah so yeah and then when you made you made you made the, the video for the color code. For, for color code as yeah. well. Daniel appears in that as well doesn't yeah he, he does yeah, actually yeah. and and his friend Orla mm. yeah and, uh, and the story yeah, it's a fairly yeah. diverse group of yeah. people in that um, for obvious reasons it's called Colour Code mm. but um, yeah the story behind that was as we wrote the song we were living in Canada and um, started to hear a lot more about the reporting from the US and Sandra Bland died and I there's just something about her that really really broke my heart mm. and and um, the mayor of New York came out at the time and uh, his child was um, is uh, biracial and he spoke about how he would talk to his child when he was going out and he was said to him, you know, if something kicks off in a bar and you're there with your um, with your white friends, you don't do you know that the outcome of of some you don't get involved like the 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 the, um, the response to you will be different to the response to them in mm -hmm. a situation like that. And uh, I just had never thought about that before, really. Uh, you worry so much about your children anyway, mm -hmm. as we've been mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. But certainly when they're going away from you and they're independent yeah. and they're going out and they're drinking and driving and mm -hmm. not at the same time. But, yeah. you know, yeah. all of those things. And um, 
to have another layer of worry, to have another, to think that the world will respond differently to you because of something, uh, you with the colour of your skin, which you're born into. Um, I just hadn't really thought about it in such a visceral mm-hmm. way before. And then I started to, I, I mean, a very small amount of investigating brought me to this huge list of um unarmed men and women mm-hmm. of color who had been killed by the police in just in 2014. And Sandra Bland was Sandra Bland was a young woman. She's 28. Um, she was arrested. And she was a law student. She was opinionated. Mm. Uh, I'm sure she wasn't totally happy about um, being stopped for her minor. It was a minor um, traffic infraction. And uh, but she was arrested really aggressively. And then she was found hung in the jail um, a day and a half later. And there were all sorts of investigations about it. Um, and they discovered a lot of procedures that were not followed. Mm. The arresting officer um, was asked to leave the police force actually afterwards. And they came to a settlement with her family for 1.9 million mm. for that was uh, between the police service and the county jail for um, wrongful death. I mean, mm. you know, 28, you really, you really yeah. think they're sort of going to be OK then, don't you? And she was really bright and just thought it was heartbreaking. And her family it started this uh, campaign uh, which called Say Her Name mm. to try and um, keep her name in the news and to help them really force the investigation to happen and to um, achieve some kind of uh, justice, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Do you worry about the world your children are going out into? Of course. Yeah. Like, but do you worry about it more than, you know, that is normal? Or do you think the world is becoming a a more dangerous place for them to go into? Because you said they're you know, feminists and like in Ireland, things have, you know, there's been a, a great couple of years in, in, yeah. in, in that side of things. But do you like there are other areas and other aspects of life where it seems more daunting and more terrifying? I mean, I think there's no doubt. I mean, so, some I have a great friend um, who constantly argues this with me and I try not to be too fearful mm. because I think that that's not fair either. And doesn't isn't everybody fearful for mm. the further children and you can't you can't keep them in a box or restrict yeah. them from growing or exploring or becoming independent of you and that would be wrong if you did um and a great friend of mine argues it all the time and he says but the world is a better place now than it used to be i mean imagine if you were in medieval times and yeah. imagine the amount of people that you know died in battle mm. or war or sickness or you know all of those yeah. things but it does seem to to me to be a much more violent place Mm -hmm. than even, you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. I I do worry about that, especially for, yeah, young men. It it does seem to be, yeah, more violent. That's. And that there's an, yeah, there's an encouragement of violence, not encouragement of violence, but that there is that tendency out there that kind of uh, school for young for for men, if you like, of you know there are kind of people out there promoting that kind of uh, aggressive kind of yeah. way of life. Yeah, and and it's um, well, it's just that it's weaponized more yeah. as well. I mean, obviously in the states, the big mm. problem is the schools, the yeah. shooting, shooting, mm. and um, and here it seems to be more knife crime. But it's it, that's the the weaponizing of it uh, is yeah, it doesn't doesn't fill me full of hope Mm. or joy. But then there are incredible things as well. And uh, like the well, obviously, our our referendums were Mm. were brilliant. And um, well, for me, they seem like um, that we voted as a country for not for ourselves personally, but for a bigger idea of Mm. some kind of social fairness for other people. So that's really positive. And for my eldest sons, those being the fir- their first kind of instances of um, voting and right, referendums okay, yeah. for them to be such a kind of mm. positive indictment, uh, they feel certainly politicized, mm. I think, and that they're that 
that their vote matters. Mm. That's only a good thing. And um, loads of young, even recently, somebody's underwear was alluded to in a rape trial. Um, so upsetting. Mm. And two days later, there was this really incredible piece of street art mm. just up the, again in, up the road in Rat Mines, go on the mines, yeah. um, with all these different pictures of kinds of knickers saying not mm. asking for it. I thought that was, yeah, again, an immediate and active mm. and socially conscious uh, response to something that was happening around us. Mm. And that's that makes me feel great. That's yeah. that's really positive. And when you when I mentioned Leonard Cohen and uh, earlier, and um, you know, you said that uh, you know they had maybe because they were men, it was easier for them. Is that something that you? that bothers you about, you know, the way men or women might be perceived, you know, as they kind of go on through life and as they get older, that there, you know, there might be different rules or that there are different rules. Yeah, I don't even <coughs> think that's to do with age. I think that's to kind of, that's a, just a really old kind of nugget that, hmm. um, but again, I've kind of jettisoned an, a, anything I think about that now. And I don't, I certainly don't ever f- feel held back by anybody else's perception of um, what I should be doing yeah. or where I should be. but um, Would you have done in the past? I wouldn't have personally, but I would have noticed certainly things like uh, a really e- simple thing. Uh, I've said it before, but I would notice at sound checks if... Um, if Kieran was having difficulty with his sound or and and needed to um, needed to fix it and and address it and go over it and maybe do the same thing again mm. and again until it happened because the sound is really important obviously if you're performing mm. and it's really important to us um, and I, I, this, how people would react to his um, what he was was experiencing compared to if I also needed to fix the sound for some reason, like much more quickly, I would see people roll their eyes or I know they'd be going, what a fucking diva. Mm. Whereas they would feel or they would be reacting to Kieran as though like, oh, what a perfectionist. You really, you know, so there's a there was a kind of a certainly a tolerance, a slightly different tolerance for um, Dem- demands of, of a certain kind that yeah. were not didn't neither demand was unreasonable but but they're the same um, demand maybe yes but exactly you're, you're but it was perceived in a different way yeah you're a diva it was accepted in a different yeah. way yeah um, but, but does that stuff still happen or is it just that you don't it doesn't bother you anymore I, I well I, I certainly I don't think about it yeah. um, but I I notice I notice it for other people mm. I notice uh, just a kind of um different reception maybe to what they're saying mm. or their uh, um, their opinion or there's certainly the situation within um, within acting for example that people get paid differently for yeah. the same work um, so there's there's lots and lots of sexism out there for sure but um, yeah I, I do my best to not engage in it and make sure I overcome it for myself and for anybody else that I can. And has has me the Me Too movement changed things a lot in the way people act and think about how they should behave? I don't know. I guess that will remain to mm. be seen. I hope so. Uh, I hope that certain kinds of behaviour will will just not be mm. tolerated um, or or that people or that young people who were in a posi- I mean, mostly I think it's difficult because a lot of the abuses of power were literally that mm. and it would be somebody in a very powerful position and somebody with no power. And so even in a situation where that's wrong, is the person with no power do they feel strong enough or able enough to to report the person or to speak out about mm. it or do they feel that that will affect their you know their chances of employment or the yeah. oh the differential in power is 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 a real thing isn't mm. it it's a very hierarchical system so 
it remains to be seen. I, I, I very much hope it will change things. Mm -hmm. I very much, yeah. And uh, like your own, like you, your career now, like you've, like you've said before that the business side of things is something that like you, you wish somebody could sort of take away and, and do all that for mm. you. But do you feel you have to like with, with the music and everything, do you, do you feel that that's a side of it that you've got better at doing or that you just have to do? Well, we have. Yeah. I yeah. mean, we do. We run a record label. Mm. We have to do that for ages and it's sort Mermaid. of. Mermaid. Yeah. And it's kind of morphed into production, Mermaid Productions mm. now because we've started doing these other things, making the films and the documentary and stuff. So um, you just, you know, you just have to accept that yeah. you're, yeah, there is not going to be any magic wand <laughs> no. that will remove, you know, VAT <laughs> returns from your life or, or whatever. So you just find a way to do them and then ask people to help you when you when you need to as well. Yeah. And what, what else is coming up this year then? Atlander? Going back to that, yeah, I'm going to, um, we're going to perform with in Mountains to the Sea, oh, which yeah. I'm really looking forward to with um, Sinead Gleeson is it's her first uh, book of her mm. own. And um, so we're going to do something special with her. She's going to read and then we're going to uh, perform kind of in response to the reading okay. or something. I'm really interested in that as a collaboration. It'd be that? lovely as well. That is the end of March. Okay. And um, we're going to do some festivals in Canada and the US in the summer and then um, go to Tallinn mm -hmm. and make that radio documentary or maybe just cry <laughs> listening to 30,000 people <laughs> sing that good, at that me. That would be a very good documentary. Yeah. Go viral. Yeah. And then we have some other um, we're, we're designing a sound and light installation for the Fringe Festival, okay. which will be so that's September in Dublin, the Fringe right. Festival. If we manage to pull that all off, it's a pretty ambitious um, idea, but I'm, I'm excited about it. So yeah. what, is, what is that? Well, we were really inspired by this piece of art that we saw um, a couple of years ago by James Terrell. And mm. it was just really it was a light installation and, and it was just really beautiful. And we both felt um, better after having seen it and you could we could only go in for I think it was about eight minutes mm -hmm. and um, we just kept thinking about it and talking about it and wondering if we could do something. Um, it was just that it was an experience and you were sort of bathed in this beautiful light and so we wanted to try and do it. So we're going to work with a, a lighting designer and make it. I think the idea will be that we will maybe have a little kind of a candle. It's called Let Let There Be Light. OK. Candles will be involved, light. And of course, we're going to design. Um, well, Kieran is going to design a soundscape. Um, so the idea, I think, would be that if you went into it, you know, four different times, you'd have a slightly different experience every time, depending on which bit of the sound uh, okay. accompanying soundtrack you'd you'd have to go with the with the lighting and yeah kind of an immersive experience not maybe 10 minutes not too long but I think I hope kind of joyful mm. and tender that tender. word again yeah, yeah. and maybe word. for some of the for some of the performances we, we might have performance have musicians mm. uh, perform live rather than just have the composed soundtrack so that would be kind of interesting as well anyway yeah another thing we're trying to do um you said once it's it took you ages to figure stuff out about yourself and about life yeah do you think you've figured it out no <laughs> <laughs> god no but i'm learning yeah um i'm learning yeah and i definitely think i'm getting a little bit quicker mm. but i think that's probably um my age and also yeah. that I'm, my my father passed away this year and um, I definitely think when that happens mm. you kind of um, you shift your yeah. access a little bit I think you're 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 in a, you're next up right you're mm. in a different kind of place so I think that something about that makes you probably speed up your yeah. speed up your learning or your instinct or makes time move a little bit differently or when more you, urgently or something. When did he pass away? In the summer, in okay. June.
And had he been ill? He had, yeah, yeah, for a little while. But it doesn't look like it's... it's uh, no, it's one of those things people say, right, you can't ever, you don't really understand it till it happens. I know. And it's true, yeah. But um, he had he had a, he was really loved and uh, we all feel we were, we were lucky to have mm-hmm. had him. He wasn't a perfect man by any means, but um, he constantly tried to be a better one. Yeah. Constantly was learning himself all his life and uh, sort of feel he kind of did almost the full circle. He kind of almost the last lesson he had to learn was um, patience. He was never a very patient right. man. He was quite a um, fiery individual. And he kind of really got that together at the end in the last few years and had this wonderful, wonderful uh, relationship with his grandchildren as well, which is okay. really brilliant. All of his grandchildren absolutely adored him. Mm. And why did he have to learn patience? Well, because everybody does yeah. at some point, don't they? Just to uh, yeah. just to be more. Yeah. Just. To and did he learn? Was did he become more patient? Because did you know? Because like if you like if you I, my father was very impatient and I remember when he got older and he became more patient it was the thing that the change in him that it, like struck me so much because it was like my god this yeah. man doesn't yeah. respond the way he, he used to respond yeah and I, I think that's the wonderful thing I mean that's that's definitely at some stage that'll be my next job will be being a grandparent mm. can't wait and you just no I mean not, not well i I'll talk to the, no. I don't, I don't need. It doesn't need to happen like right now. Let me just in case my sons are watching this. Um, but that opportunity, I think, is a wonderful one where you get to be the person that can be a bit. You know, you don't have to be quite so rigid or consistent yeah. in your yeah. instruction because you're not the person that's sort of laying down these this bedrock of you're stuff that has the, to be done. Y- yeah, well, <laughs> thanks be to God, I won't have to worry about them. But you can just be a bit mad. You can, mm. you know, sit up and late at night eating chips in bed mm. and um, watching Fellini movies mm. or I don't know what all the kinds of things you could do. But um, also you, your children will get, your grandchildren will get to experience you at a different stage where you're yeah not so maybe not quite so much under pressure and not so worried about them because someone else is doing the worrying mm. so you get a more have a different kind of time and a different bond and I think that mm. would be beautiful that certainly was lovely for my my dad and he he loved that did he he did yeah yeah yeah, yeah. sure who wouldn't I know, I know. <laughs> Maria that was wonderful thank you thank you thank lovely you. to talk to you